Welcome to Monticello's live stream. I'm Carrie Subra, and I'm excited to moderate the discussion today about the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Abigail Adams, with Bill Barker as Jefferson and Abigail Schumann as Adams. Please ask your questions in the comments and let us know where you're joining from. Oh, <laughs> gentlemen and ladies, what a pleasure it is to be in your company once again. Uh, for all of you to come visit us here at our Monticello. This is a most uniquely unrecorded moment in our nation's history, and particularly our history with Monticello, to have our good friend, Mrs. Abigail Adams, with us, and to enjoy a conversation amongst all of us engaged with questions by Miss Carrie Subra. Uh, without a further comment from me, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you all Mrs. Abigail Adams, ma'am. I thank you, Mr. Jefferson, and welcome to you as I myself am welcomed here. I look forward to our conversation. Hmm. Mrs. Adams, if you will, a, a chair. Oh, thank you, sir. Please hmm. join me. I thank you, indeed. Well, <laughs> I'm very curious as to hear what we will be asked of today and considering the length of time we have known one and the other and of course my mutual friend and your dear husband John Adams. Uh, so shall we engage the first question? But of course. Hmm. Ms. What had each of you heard about the other before you knew each other and what were your impressions when you first met? Uh, well, I, I suppose I heard of you long before I actually met you, um, in particular when my husband was attending the Grand Congress in Philadelphia, at the Continental Congress, where he and Mr. Jefferson became most well acquainted. Uh, John, Mr. Adams was forever writing to me about uh, your skill with the pen, sir, in addition to the arguments and compromises being worked out in that sweltering heat. Mm. It was terribly hot um, during all of the Congresses, but particularly the extension of the second, and, and that was in the spring of 1776. But I had heard about your husband well before that. Oh, yes, indeed. He had become renowned throughout all of the colonies because of his defense of the British soldiers during that massacre in Boston when that was March of 70, was it not? It was indeed. And it stands in, in stark contrast in my memories because my husband risked so much to stand in defense of the British soldiers who had fired upon a crowd. Uh, and there had been loss of life. But John announced at that time, and it has always been true to him, that facts are stubborn things, and if one seeks the facts, one will find the truth. And though he feared his reputation might be ruined, it was, it was that trial and the exoneration of uh, many of those accused and lesser sentences for those that were found guilty that brought him to the attention of uh, those who invited him to join the Congress mm -hmm. in the Massachusetts delegation. Citizens, I certainly remember that the facts Mrs. Adams is referring to so staunchly uh, preserved, protected, stood upon by her husband, John Adams, were truly what united uh, 13 individual nations. They brought us all together more than anything else. And then <laughs> I first heard about you, uh, well, I think you've already discovered, I heard about you through a letter that you wrote your husband that spring of 1776, a remarkable letter indeed, and speaking about facts, good heavens, Mrs. Adams, that letter was disseminated uh, among several in the Continental Congress, but I had the pleasure to be amongst the first to read it. And to my mortification, my husband made practice of sharing my private correspondence to him with members of the Congress. He told me that it allowed, it allowed the other men to understand the plight of those who were not as fortunate as they. And uh, I 
asked him, since they were creating a new government in entirety, why not then remember the ladies mm. in that design and be more generous and favorable to them than had been their ancestors? I mean, truly, Mr. Jefferson, you must admit that men of good sense abhor customs that treat women like slaves. Oh. And I simply entreated Mr. Adams to make sure that the, the desires of the ladies were remembered or we would we would be determined to foment a revolution of our own. Mm. <laughs> and we would not be held by any law in which we had no representation. Mm -hmm. Exactly as I remember it at its very first reading. Mrs. Adams, you spoke not for the ladies at that time, but I can assure you your words will resonate through generations yet unborn to remind all of us uh, of the ladies, not only during times of conflict and contest, but during times of peace. Um, in my opinion, it is, it is indeed the ladies that are want to maintain the peace, perhaps more than gentlemen have been able to succeed throughout time. Mm -hmm. Your next question, Ms. Subra. Deborah asks if both would share their thoughts on influential women of their day. How did women make their power felt? Hmm, how did we make our power felt? Well, perhaps uh, the two most influential women that come to my mind would be my dear friend, Mercy Otis Warren. Uh, she has penned in her own hand, and after many years of study, uh, a history of our American Revolution. And although there are those who did not find her assessment of them favorable, Mr. Adams in particular, I believe that, uh, that Mercy has indeed captured a moment in time in such a way that it will be remembered through generations, sir, uh, hopefully much, much longer than my personal correspondence. The other I would have to name in that pantheon would be Lady Washington herself. Uh, she was so gracious to me when my husband was vice president and when John Adams was elected to the presidency she tendered very wise advice to me uh, to, to remember that that is really just a moment and the moment is, is for the people. It is not about us. And that was the best advice I have yet received. I remember Mrs. Washington quite well. Indeed, a lady who always spoke uh, with great manner and, and great concern and great interest in the affairs of others. And who could deny that she was of great support uh, to her dear husband, the general. But um, Ms. Deborah, if you ask me, the lady's most influential in my life, I certainly cannot deny my own mother, uh, Jane Randolph Jefferson. Uh, I realized at all too early an age, I was only 14. Uh, when my father passed away, leaving my mother a widow to preside over the rearing of 10 children. Good heavens, what a weight upon my shoulders. I did the best that I could. And to think that as I was preparing to leave to go up to Philadelphia, to sit on the committee with your husband and draft our Declaration of American Independence, that last day in March of 1776, my mother was suddenly taken ill and passed away within a short time. Oh my heavens, I was almost, uh, I was almost done in by a migraine headache that accompanied me for two weeks. There's no question, and you've heard me speak of her before, my late wife, uh, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson, will always remain very deep in my heart. I cannot deny the, the number of women here about Shadwell Farm, where I was born and grew up, uh, around Monticello and, and our neighboring farms who labor for my happiness, never to be forgotten in that regard. And finally, Miss Deborah, Mrs. Abigail Adams herself, oh, Mrs. Adams, suggest the recitation a few moments ago of your letter, your letter that will resonate throughout the ages as indication 
of the influence that you have had not only in your own time, but will continue to have. You know, they refer to another of us as uh, the founding fathers. Please do not forget the founding mothers. Oh, you do flatter, Mr. Jefferson. Perhaps we should move on to the next question. You both sailed separately to Europe in 1784. What were your shared experiences while in France and then later in England? <laughs> oh, we almost sailed together. <laughs> that was your intention and it was much appreciated that you would try and, uh, and intercept me. Um, this was when I was in Boston to book passage uh, to come and, and join Mr. Adams after a five-year absence from one another. And um, uh, Mr. Jefferson, I remember you coming and making yourself known to me and saying that you would travel with me to see that all of my needs were met aboard ship. For well, my husband had cautioned me that being on a ship was no place for a lady. But you did not have passage on the active as I did. I had already paid my way and spoken with the captain and could not pull out for we were to leave the very next day. But uh, I was very grateful to you. And that turned out to be our very first meeting. The very first time we met one and the other, having heard so much about you beforehand, to think that it was nearly 10 years later that I was able to, to meet you uh, personally. And perhaps it was far too much of a presumption uh, to think that after five years not seeing your husband, uh, that you might welcome to travel with me. Uh, an afterthought, I am happy uh, that your ship sailed the earlier and uh, that I following not too long thereafter. And then yes, to, to meet in, in France. Do you know, I believe that uh, the ship I, I sailed upon uh, arrived in France or for me to be able to travel uh, once landing in France to Paris before your own arrived. Oh, indeed. Well, perhaps it may be true, for I did not sail to France. I sailed to England and uh, was there for some short time waiting for my husband to, who was to come uh, and uh, send for me on his way from the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, he, he came uh, by surprise uh, as I waited for him there, uh, thinking at last that he would not be able to keep the rendezvous. And um, well, as poets and artists say, we must draw a veil upon those things that surpass expression. Uh, suffice it to say, we were delighted to be reunited. Oh, what an understatement indeed. Ms. <laughs> um, Suber, your, your next question. Would you tell us about some of the ways that Adams and Jefferson's children were connected to each other and to you two? And Andrina would like to know what Mrs. Adams thinks of Mr. Jefferson's daughters. Oh, oh well, Mr. Jefferson's daughters are a delight. Um, when we first arrived in France, uh, Mr. Adams and I, and we're at last acquainted with you and your daughters, uh, well, with your elder daughter. She was staying at a convent at the time, but would uh, come uh, on occasion to accompany to theater or to come to dine, and charming, charming um, young woman. And um, some years later, uh, when Mr. Adams was appointed as the ambassador to the court of St. James, of which I take great pride even today. Um, your daughter Polly came to stay with us in England as she made her crossing after her father sent for her. Um, Polly traveled with uh, the young girl Sally, Sally, Sally Hemmings. Sally she was but 14, Polly nine. And <laughs> I dare say that uh, Sally could uh, take care of Polly was um, uh, probably not uh, exactly the way to put it. They seemed of the same age and, uh, and countenance, but it was, it was a pleasure to have your daughter with me for that time. Although I must say um, it would have served her well had you come to uh, collect her in person rather than sending a servant whom she could barely understand and certainly did not know. 
I'm afraid that I was delayed, if you recall, my um, attentions I had to pay, of course, at the royal court of Louis XVI. And, uh, well, you became all too aware of that when finally you joined your husband in Paris uh, before sailing uh, back to England, where the two of you lived there, and he attended to uh, St. James's Palace. Uh, our children, may I say, were friends with one and the other, and intimately so. And I cannot help but recount uh, the great privilege they had, did they not, uh, in being able to engage a society quite different from that in Boston, let alone out here in the wilderness, in the forest primeval. Uh, remember that we all attended the theater together, a Nabby, of course, and uh, John Quincy Adams, and uh, my daughter, uh, now Mrs. Randa, but Patsy, Martha, uh, all of us engaging theater, and oh, several repasts, the elegant dinners uh, that you and your husband provided at Octoy. That beautiful hotel uh, where you lived in Paris. No, our children were very, very fortunate. And um, though there was somewhat of a, a disengaging, if you will, of both um, correspondence and, um, and friendly association during the two terms, uh, I was chief magistrate of the nation. Well, now John Quincy Adams did come to visit at the president's house. What a most remarkable boy he is. I, I must tell you that that boy has more knowledge universal than anyone I can possibly think of. <laughs> he should make a very fine chief magistrate someday. Uh, it's my opinion. Oh, yes. Your next question, Ms. Super. Your friendship, of course, as you all have mentioned, included Mrs. Adams' husband, John. You traveled through England together, Mr. Jefferson, then lived in New York at the same time while both of you were serving in the U.S. government. Can you tell us some of the highlights of your times together? Did you share tastes in the arts and literature? <laughs> Remember when we were all together in London and we decided that uh, Mr. Adams and myself should have our portraits painted by uh, Brown, Mather Brown. Uh, I'll never forget that sitting. And uh, then we exchanged the portraits one to the other. I believe you still have my portrait that your beautiful Indeed. home piece field. Yes, and it, 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 that you should mention uh, portraits and the like. It was a portrait of uh, Mr. Adams that I first saw when I was coming to England to join him. Um, uh, Mr. Copley had painted a very fine likeness of my husband and enjoyed it, invited me to uh, come and view it. But it was after seeing that portrait and he showed us through his galleries and there was a painting, uh, The Death of Pearson. And I know it would have moved you greatly. Uh, Colonel Pearson uh, lay in the arms of his officers with his wound in his side, the blood, you could almost see it flow. You could hear the groans of his men. And there stood by them a black servant with his piece raised, pointed at the one who had inflicted the wound. I vow I stared at that portrait until I felt faint. It was so alive on the canvas. And I know that we have shared uh, our, our love of art and, and of theater. And have you ever been so moved by a painting? I have indeed been moved by the paintings of David. Uh, I think his Oath of the Harati uh, is absolutely stunning when it reminds us of what a brotherhood of man can accomplish on behalf of protecting and defending the inalienable rights of their fellow man. Uh, you were not there at the time, but um, I uh, was recalled by our new government under the Constitution uh, at the time when General the Marquis de Lafayette and I were working on a French Bill of Rights and the Citizen. This was the spring of 1789. And during daily trips to, to Versailles, I was able to bear witness to the gathering of the three estate generals. And, uh, oh, yes, yes, of course, the clergy and the bourgeoisie and, and of course, the, 
the third class itself, um, and always the, the royal and noble line there at the top. Uh, the third class was prohibited to enter into the menu plaisir where they had been gr greeting them. You recall that great banquet hall oh, at yeah. Versailles. And so do you know that they finally all gathered in a jean de Pum, a tennis court, and they all took an oath to remain together, over 570 together. The tennis court oath, they refer to it. This was a subject that David pursued as well. Remember when we attended the salons frequently in uh, the Tuileries palaces there, the Louvre, uh, where it was. Uh, and so many wonderful portraits and, and paintings and sculpture in kind. And I beg your pardon, here we are supposed to be discoursing upon New York and our times in New York. But I, I'm certainly not trying to denigrate our times in New York, but there was a particular urgency. There was a, a particular, hmm, what should we call it, uh, a, um, a tension, political tension that was beginning to accrue uh, during our, our time in New York uh, while we were testing out our very young constitution and its Bill of Rights. I believe the contest was certainly not so much with your husband at that time, and I beg your pardon, citizens, but the, the contest was between myself and um, our new Secretary of the Treasury, yes. General Hamilton. Yes, <laughs> the little general indeed. Those were contentious times, and uh, they were times that um, tried friendship, um, to uh, the, the utmost uh, in the years to come. But there were enjoyable evenings together, dining and laughing and, and sharing our travels and memories um, of our travels uh, abroad. Remember when we all gathered at France's tavern? <laughs> that was not very far from my residence down there at Maiden Lane. No, they were... They were wonderful respites away from the heated rooms of politics. Yes. <laughs> your next question, Ms. Well, Drake right. would like to know about each of your relationships with Alexander ha Hamilton. And additionally, would you be willing to tell us something of those tensions and differences you just mentioned between you two, as well as John Adams, and how they arose? <sighs> Oh my, <laughs> you have asked quite the question. Um, as to my relationship with Mr. Hamilton, I, I prefer it to be brief and short whenever in his company, although he did dine with us um, uh, when uh, we were in, in New York and, uh, and he was an engaging man in his way, but his politics I found to be very underhanded. And um, I, I don't have a good word to say, so I shall uh, stop my mouth. The most gracious, Mrs. Adams. I, I wish I could be as gracious in my reply, Drake, <laughs> uh, for I could not possibly make a comment that is, uh, is but temporary. Uh, I shall introduce you uh, to the entrance hall of, um, of Monticello, and you will see therein, Mrs. Adams, uh, a rather overly barge, large bust of myself uh, cut by Karachi. But then as you look over opposite at the other side of the room, to the left as you enter, you will see a beautifully carved bust of General Hamilton. Um, and when people are there, as you shall see, and I will be standing next to you, I will comment that, yes, there the two of us will gaze across at one and the other in opposition throughout death as we have been in life. So, no, I, I should not go into, if you will, what I could extensively, uh, the differences of opinion between General Hamilton and myself, and knowing that your husband felt the same as I did, and particularly Mr. Madison, uh, I should simply say that the arguments between us, Drake, have existed from time immemorial, and they will continue to exist. The great question of how man ought to be governing himself. Uh, ought it be those of property and 
prestige and means, if you will, even titles, who hold a great deal of financial influence to govern over men? Or should it be the common man? And General Hamilton understood these differences, if you will, these differences of opinion. He understood why we fought our American Revolution on behalf of the common man. But I think that what your husband, John Adams, understood, and I know you do, and I certainly do, was understood by General Hamilton, that as Americans, a difference of opinion ought never be a difference of principle. Now, what, what evolved between your husband and myself, I look at as, I look at as simply politics itself, simply the, the twistifications of the facts and the like that can come in to the affairs of mankind and provoke a great misunderstanding. That is what I think about that last time that we were all together in the president's house that February of 1801. Remember, the, the election, the presidential election was as yet undecided in the electoral college. I've received the majority of the popular vote. Indeed. And as you have stated, Mr. Jefferson, I believe it is true. There is a distinction that should be drawn between friendship and politics. Our friendship has endured for nigh on 50 years, and our politics have weathered quite some storms. I believe that factionalism is the enemy here, not any person. Well said, Mrs. Adams. Can you certainly understand how, how you were of such great support to your husband throughout all of those occasions in which we differed in our politics, in which we secured uh, more substantially the political platforms um, the last time we met in the president's house, that February of 1801, you were so gracious to be with the two of us for a time, and then you left us alone. And we realized that we were but victims of political schism, that two others could be standing in our shoes and fallen victim as well, and that no difference of opinion between two friends in either politics or religion should come into the friendship and dissolve the friendship because if it does, then there has never been a friendship to begin with. And that was the thread that I am glad did not break when you and Mr. Adams had your, how does one say, falling out uh, over the election of 1800. It was a very, very painful time for Mr. Adams. As you know, we had lost our son Charles at about that same date. And uh, so he was taken on the personal front and on his reputation uh, as a politician. And it was quite a blow for him. I, I wish you to know, Mrs. Adams, that I certainly would have arrived personally to express uh, my great remorse and my sadness and... There's no need. There's no need to make apology now, sir. It is in the past. And in the past, it should remain. As you have said, Mrs. Adams, and happy indeed to hear that our friendship uh, has survived. Although lamentably, uh, there is a period of a good 11 years uh, from that month of February 1801 when your husband and I were not in correspondence. Now, happily, happily, well, yes, happily, the two of us were able to correspond, though upon equally as sad circumstances. Indeed, sir. It seems that in all uh, circumstance of our correspondence, I have been the first to write. I wrote to you first from England to France when Mr. Adams and I had removed there. And after this long separation in our friendship, I wrote to you upon the death of your sweet Polly. Oh, she had been quickly a, a fast a fast child of my own heart when she stayed with me in England. And to lose her, I know, was a searing pain, for I too have felt that loss. And particularly if you recall when she had to leave you. Oh, yes. When, when uh, what was his name? Petit? 
Petit, who you sent to uh, to take her away, the servant. Oh, the poor child. She she clung round my neck and and she proclaimed, "Now that I have learned to love you, why must they take me away?" And oh, I was heartbroken. And that is why, Mr. Jefferson, and I will not bring it up again in future, I promise. But this one last emphasis on the fact that you did that young child a disservice not to fetch her yourself. I know you had engagement, but you could have delayed coming for she was quite content with Mr. Adams and I. I read with her every day and uh, we had wonderful conversations for a nine-year-old. She was quite lively. I remember my greatest fear as she was taken off was that he would send her to the convent along with her eldest sister. Uh, their temperaments are not matched and uh, I did not think she would thrive there, but I'm sorry, I don't mean to. No, no, Mrs. Adams, you speak directly. You speak the facts as I recall them. And in such knowledge, I continue to do myself a disservice. When you wrote me upon the death of my dear Polly, Mrs. Epps, she was only 24 years of age. And, um, you were so kind to write and to share your sympathies and your empathy. And to think that when I replied and so interested and, and fervent, if you will, to, to continue our friendship, that I should reply after but a few lines and dig up the hatchet, if you will, of the political differences between your husband and myself. I, I shall not go into those midnight appointments. It would do all of us a disservice, particularly with having Mrs. Adams here in our company. I beg pardon, sir. If you shall not go into them, why should you even mention them? You have dug up the hatchet and you have wielded it, sir. I have Indeed, Mr. Adams was within his power and duty as the president of these United States to fill each of the offices as they became vacant. And he did so, sir. And there should be no contention that he did so. And all these years later, I am, I am rather distressed that it still bothers you. I have dug it up yet again. Perhaps we should go to another question. No, I am thankful that even here, at my own home, you have expressed so well yet again what you expressed in your last letter to me. You are correct. I should better my manners. My apologies. It is nothing, Mr. Jefferson, truly. Uh, your next question, Ms. Subban. Mrs. Adams, Bridget notes, you described slavery as a sin. However, she wonders if you believe in racial equality. And would you each share your views on slavery and how do they differ? Yes, I do believe that slavery is a sin. I would that there was not a slave uh, throughout our republic. But um, uh, I... I have often uh, found myself perplexed that we would fight for that very thing that every day we robbed and plundered from other people who have every right to freedom that we do. Uh, I stand by that. And Mr. Adams and I have never owned slaves. We have hired free blacks. We have hired on occasion enslaved people with the assurance that they would keep their own wage. Um, I think perhaps the question and the conundrum it presents might best be answered by you, Mr. Jefferson. Is Bridget, Mrs. Adams knows well that this is a question that I cannot answer sincerely or with evidence in the history of my efforts to do what I can to seek its abolishment, uh, to rectify the inheritance 
that I've received, not only from my parents and my grandparents, but my late wife, because all of it would seem most trivial and but um, excuses. Mrs. Adams, you know indeed that it is felt far more by me here and by all of us here uh, in our, our new southern states and commonwealths uh, than up north, and yet not to deny that, uh, that we showed the rest of the world that we could bring together 13 individual nations, e pluribus unum, that there was slavery in every single one of them, that there continues, if you will, since 1809, when I signed the bill to end the importation of slaves here to our nation, there continues the smuggling thereby in Newport, Rhode Island, and New Haven, Connecticut. I am not trying to cast aspersions, believe me. This is a complicated question, and it's a complicated question for all of us because it remains protected. We have a constitution in these times by decisions of our Supreme Court. And I know your husband understands as I do, particularly your husband, your son, John Quincy Adams, that it is a fault in our constitution. Our constitution is but a compromise upon the subject. Of course it is, and I, and I would remind you, sir, I would remind you that from the very formation of our republic, there was the opportunity to call it out for the egregious, uh, perpetration upon our nation that it was. And I recollect, you see, just as Mr. Adams would share my correspondence with his friends in Congress, he would share with me what was transpiring there and send me, sent me indeed an early copy of a draft of the Declaration of Independence in which uh, amongst the, uh, the offenses called out and the crimes against the king, was that of the if the slave trade, and you were eloquent, and I thought at the time when I read it that that John himself, Mr. Adams, that he had written it because it expressed his sentiment. But no, it was you, was it not? Oh, precisely so. I had already expressed it several times when I was a young member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. And yet, not long thereafter, when I first heard the declaration read. I was in Boston at the time with my children to be inoculated. The smallpox was ravaging our towns and cities and, and the army as well. But nonetheless, I was in Boston and heard the Declaration of Independence read uh, from the State House balcony. And I marked that that was no longer in it. The, that manly statement, that, that, that stand against this great sin had been omitted. And I wondered, no one else listening knew what almost could have been. Why was it stricken? Protest. Protests of certain delegates from what were still at that time, we were drafting the declaration, but were still colonies. I, I almost hesitate to, to pronounce what colonies these delegates represented because here we allow it to continue to fester. But the answer is simply compromise. It was a compromise. And, and as I mentioned, the constitution later followed in kind. You know, Perhaps, and I realize your husband understands this, even the late General Hamilton understood this. Dr. Franklin certainly understood it. He, he was nearly chairman of the committee to draft a declaration. He nearly took up the pen first. But it is still our declaration, which His Excellency President Washington referred to as our promise, which will remain through generations yet unborn, a representation of the inalienable rights of man, given to man, not to any government and not to any ruler, but provided each and every soul by nature and nature's God. And I know your husband understands that all eyes are open and will continue to open to these rights of man. But history has every right to be harsh upon us. Thank you, Bridget. Um, Ms. Subaru, your next question.
Well, this brings us to a question, which Mrs. Adams, you, you and Mr. Jefferson have been speaking of the Declaration of Independence. Would you comment on how you see the Declaration of Independence? And Mary Lou asks, what is your wish for the future of women and of America? Oh, well, how do I see the Declaration of Independence? Uh, I, I, I believe, despite my disappointments, uh, that as Mr. Jefferson has stated, it is a sublime document and it will hopefully guide our Republic uh, through many generations ahead with its promise. And one day, perhaps that promise will be fulfilled and part of the fulfillment of that promise is to remember the ladies and to make sure that they are treated equal to the men, that daughters are educated in the same way as sons. Because how can we have learned statesmen if we do not have learned women who are teaching their children in those very formative years of their lives? And how can women who are unfortunate to tie themselves to profligate men, to gambling or drinking men. It hurts my heart for I, I have within my own family seen the experience of, of women left with no recourse, of women left with no ability to claim their own property, to claim their own money, to care for their children if their husband is not willing or able. And I hope that the future for women will be much brighter indeed than that current situation. I hardly know how I can follow your comments, Mrs. Adams. I, I hope that the declaration will be as I said, it already is a clarion call to future generations. I could not have possibly achieved any sort of recognition in drafting the document without the aid of your husband. He was the one on the committee who spoke most often uh, in order to provide further alterations and clarity and precision and fact. And yes, though the general referred to our, our declaration as the promise, he referred to our constitution as its guarantee. And yet you heard me say that our constitution is a compromise in itself and still protects the barbarous institution of slavery. And yet there is one recourse that allows it to continue to grow and to be of effect and encouraging more and more to speak their mind freely and to be represented directly and distinctly. And that's the, the first paragraph, the first line in itself. We, the people. Even now, Mrs. Adams, to think that as we enjoy this conversation, in the majority of the states of our wonderful nation, which, as you know, I consider the world's best hope, you still have no vote. Mm. And in Jersey, they allowed the women to have a vote for, vote for what, what, 30 years, I think, no more. They allowed by accident of circumstance, I would say, otherwise it would have continued. So there you are, citizens, to think that now we're bound to have the representation of we the people given only by the white male freeholder. A very small percentage of the population of our growing nation it still remains that very first line that, in my opinion, will be the beacon light to move us forward, to continue our arguments and debates, to continue to bear witness to what Mrs. Adamson said, and particularly to read what you have written, that it might continue of the greatest inspiration as it has been already to me and many others. I am. Um, I am thankful for this time that we have had together. Likewise, sir. I am thankful for Ms. Carrie Subra to have um, proffered your curiosities and questions here. I look forward to our next gathering, and I look forward now to, to welcome Mrs. Adams into our Monticello. But I think it quite proper 
to always allow the lady the last word. You are too kind, Mr. Jefferson. And, and there, is, there is little I can add to such eloquence as you have just shared with us, other than to say that it was you and Mr. Adams, hand in hand, that were instrumental in bringing about the Declaration of Independence. I know there were others at Congress who contributed and commented and called for compromise. But I believe that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are the ones who will be remembered, and rightly so, for looking at our new republic across the divide and finding a way to maintain friendship throughout all of the trials and tribulations of forming a new nation. I'm grateful to have known you both. Sir. So.